வணக்கம் வென் வி கன்சிடர் சின்ட்ரோம்ஸ் அக்கரிங் வித் சின்டாக்டலி த காமனஸ்ட் சின்ட்ரோம்ஸ் தட் கம் டு அவர் மைண்ட் ஆர் ஏப்பர்ட் சின்ட்ரோம் அண்ட் போலண்ட் சின்ட்ரோம் தோ போத் தி சின்ட்ரோம்ஸ் ஹாவ் அ காமன் டினாமினேட்டர் தட் இஸ் சின்டாக்டலி தெர் ஆர் சோ மெனி டிஃபரன்சஸ் பிட்வீன் த டூ and even the syndactyly that occurs is different in the two syndromes let us see eppert syndrome and poland syndrome because when we see a patient with a syndactyly we need to identify whether it's an eppert syndrome or a poland syndrome and the treatment naturally is going to differ in this video we shall be talking about two syndromes both of which are associated with syndactyly of the fingers first the apert syndrome william wheaton was the first to describe a case with similar characteristics of what we know as apert syndrome in 1894 but it was eugene apert a french physician in paris who described nine collected cases in 1906 Apert syndrome is otherwise known as acrocephalosyndactyly. Acro is Greek for peak. The peaked head that is seen in the syndrome is said to have given this word in this diagnosis. The term cephalo also from Greek meaning head and of course the term syndactyly referring to webbing of fingers and toes. So, Apert syndrome is a congenital disorder characterized by craniosynostosis and syndactyly of hands and feet as far as the incidence of this condition is concerned the birth prevalence of apert syndrome ranges from 7.6 to 22.3 per million live births and males and females are equally affected by this condition apert syndrome has been found to be caused by a mutation in the gene encoding fibroblast growth factor receptor 2 otherwise known as FGFR2 at the gene map locus of 10Q26 what happens is actually substitutions at two amino acid positions in the gene most cases are sporadic but autosomal dominant inheritance has also been reported we can study the clinical features of apert syndrome by studying the craniofacial features features of the lower limbs in such patients generalized features and involvement of the hands first we shall learn a little about the craniofacial features which are a characteristic of apert syndrome when the child is born the skull is not totally solid there are two soft areas which have not yet calcified the anterior fontanelle and the posterior fontanelle The skull is made up of multiple bones which are united by sutures which allow the growth of the underlying brain to occur the metopic suture the coronal suture the sagittal suture and the lambdoid suture so these sutures can allow the underlying brain to grow in a normal way so that the skull can expand both in the anteroposterior direction and in the lateral direction but if the coronal suture and the lambdoid sutures are fused prematurely what happens is that the skull cannot grow in an anteroposterior direction it can only grow in a lateral direction because the sagittal suture and the metopic suture are still intact this is what happens in apert syndrome premature closure of the coronal and often lambdoid sutures of the skull resulting in a skull that grows only in the lateral direction and cannot grow in the anteroposterior direction this also results in mid face hypoplasia due to this restricted growth there is also high incidence of increased intracranial pressure and obstructive sleep apnea the lower limbs are also affected in apert syndrome hips become increasingly stiff over time the knees demonstrate mild to moderate genu valgum the feet have simple and complete syndactyly the foot deformity causes shoe fitting problems and abnormal gait 
and possible pain due to calluses over prominent fifth and third metatarsal heads. The generalized features of Apert syndrome include oily skin, hyperhidrosis, decreased eyesight and hearing, and increased strabismus. The affected children often display impaired language development and motor skills. In these children, the level of function depends more on their intellectual capacities than the severity of the extremity involvement. But most apert children are capable of self-care over 5 years of age. Apart from the involvement of the skull, the face, the lower limbs and generalized features, involvement of the upper limb is very important in apert syndrome. The shoulder is involved where the range of motion of the shoulder is reduced and it may be seen that there is a marked deltoid muscular atrophy and anterior subluxation of the humeral head which should be looked for in these children. The elbow is not that severely affected but the movements may be slightly decrease but do not worsen over the years with the growth of the child. The involvement of the hands is most important and we can understand the different involvement of the hand by the Upton's classification. Upton has classified the Apert syndrome hand into type 1, 2 and 3. This is to help in clinical decision making. In the type 1 hand, which is otherwise known as a spade hand due to the resemblance to the spade, there is a radially deviated small thumb with a shallow first web. The index middle and ring fingers display complete or complex syndactyly. The little finger is attached by a simple, complete or incomplete syndactyly and can mostly move at the distal interphalangeal joint. The metacarpophalangeal joints have adequate range of motion. In the type 2 hand, known as a mitten or spoon hand due to the resemblance to the mitten, the thumb is radially deviated again and has an incomplete or complete simple syndactyly with the index finger. The index, middle and ring fingers are distally fused, creating a curve in the palm with divergent metacarpals. The little finger is attached to the ring with a mostly complete but simple syndactyly. In the Upton type 3 hand, which is otherwise known as a rose bud hand due to the resemblance to the rose bud, the thumb, index, middle and ring fingers are distally fused either with cartilaginous or bony attachments. The thumb can be very difficult to identify separately from the index. The little finger is united to the ring finger usually by a simple complete syndactyly. The nails can be confluent or have ridges indicating the distal finger underneath. Because of the abnormal finger nails position, they sometimes grow through the surrounding skin leading to frequent peronychal infections and this happens typically in type 3 Upton Apert syndrome hand. Proximal synostosis at the base of the 4th and 5th metacarpal can be present as well as carpal fusion. Apart from these features, we can also have symphalangism that is the phalanges are fused to each other, there is no joint. Typically, the proximal interphalangeal joint is absent and the proximal phalanx and middle phalanx are fused to each other. This symphalangism is not restricted to type 3, it can also occur in type 1 or type 2. The appearance of the thumb is also characteristic in Apert syndrome hand. The proximal phalanx of the thumb is abnormal and triangular shaped. It is known as a delta phalanx. The interphalangeal joint and the carpometacarpal joint have very little movement while the metacarpophalangeal joint is usually mobile. With skeletal maturity, the interphalangeal joint fuses after first being segmented. The distal phalanx and the nail matrix are broad. A very important point to remember here is that the terms spade hand, mitten hand, rose bud hand should not be used in practice. They are being mentioned here so that we understand what it looks like. That's all. Now let us try to summarize 
the different features in the different types of hand in Apert syndrome children. In type 1, the thumb shows brachyclinodactyly, that is, the thumb is short and radially deviated, and there is an incomplete first web syndactyly or the first web may be intact. The index, middle, and ring fingers show complex syndactyly and may show symphalangism. The little finger may be normal or there may be a simple incomplete syndactyly. There may be a synostosis between the bases of the fourth and fifth metacarpal bones. In type 2, the thumb again shows brachyclinodactyly and there may be a simple incomplete syndactyly between the thumb and the index fingers. The index, middle and ring fingers show symphalangism and complex syndactyly as in type 1. The little finger shows complete syndactyly with the ring finger. Duplication of the terminal phalanx may be seen and again we may find a synostosis between the base of the 4th and 5th metacarpal bones. In type 3, the thumb may show brachydactyly, complex syndactyly with the index finger and recurrent peronychal infections. Similarly, the index, middle and ring fingers, apart from symphalangism and complex syndactyly, may show peronychal infections also. The little finger shows a complete syndactyly with duplication of the terminal phalanx and again synostosis of the base of the 4th and 5th metacarpal bones. The obvious surgical goals in the management of the hand in Apert syndrome are separation of the thumb and fingers and correction of the thumb and the thumb web. The procedure for separation of the fingers in Apert hand follows the same principles as for syndactyly release. You can click on the icon above to access the video on principles of congenital syndactyly release. As far as the apert hand syndactyly is concerned, we mostly use dorsal flaps for resurfacing the webs and the remaining distal syndactyly can be released following the principles that I have already mentioned. In this example, in the first stage, index and mid finger was released and then in the second stage, the ring and little fingers were released. This is the result at the end of two stages. What needs to be done is the release of the syndactyly between the middle and ring fingers and deepening of the thumb web. If there is symphalangism, there is no need for zigzag incisions. We can always make straight incisions to release the syndactyly. The residual defects are usually covered with skin grafts, usually full thickness grafts taken from the groin region. Habinet used small external fixators to transversely distract the complicated and complex syndactyly of central fingers with separation of the distal bone fusions. As far as releasing and deepening the thumb web space is concerned, in type 1 apert hand, 4 or 5 flap Z plasty can be utilized and if it is a type 2 apert hand, a large dorsal flap is used to create a first web. Though Poland syndrome is also characterized by syndactyly between the fingers, it is different from the apert syndrome. In 1841, Poland described cadaver findings as a student demonstrator of anatomy. Clarkson published his series of three cases and named the syndrome after Poland. The two prominent features of Poland syndrome are deficiency of the pectoral muscles and ipsilateral symbrachydactyly. But these are not the only features as we shall soon see. These findings may also have associations with other syndromes or sequences like the Mobius syndrome, Klippelfield syndrome and the Peary robin sequence. The incidence of Poland syndrome is approximately 1 in 7,000 to 100,000 live births. There is a male preponderance, especially in the sporadic cases, and the right side is involved in 60 to 75 percent of cases. Despite some familial occurrence, no inheritance patterns have been determined. The most prevailing theory focuses on the interruption of blood supply to the limb bud 
in the sixth week of gestation. This interruption is said to cause hypoplasia to the ipsilateral subclavian artery or one of the branches determining the diversity of the defect. A teratogenic etiology has also been suggested because research shows an association with maternal smoking and cocaine use. The clinical features of Poland syndrome can be studied under thoracic problems, upper limb problems and other miscellaneous problems. Among the thoracic problems, the classical is either absence or hypoplasia of the shoulder girdle, scoliosis and dextrocardia if it is a left-sided Poland syndrome. In 40% there may be unilateral nipple hypoplasia or agenesis, breast hypoplasia or agenesis in 20% and thoracic wall anomalies in 30% and in 20% of the cases the periscapular muscles can be hypoplastic like the latissimus dorsi, the serratus anterior, infraspinatus, supraspinatus and the deltoid muscles. The upper limb affectation in Poland syndrome is quite characteristic again. Typically, the sternocostal head of the pectoralis major muscle is absent in 30% of individuals with Poland syndrome. But the entire pectoralis major is absent in 70% of patients. The ipsilateral arm may also be hypoplastic. As far as the fingers are concerned, there is a simple syndactyly of all the fingers as seen in these clinical pictures. And typically we can note the absence of the middle phalanx of the fingers in most of these cases. So, since these fingers are shorter and also fused they are sometimes known as symbrachydactyly. The impact of these features on hand function is also significant. There is reduced dexterity because the combination of hand abnormalities can limit the range of motion and fine motor skills. There is reduced grasping and manipulation function in the hand because there is difficulty in grasping, pinching and other fine motor tasks. It also gives rise to cosmetic concerns because severe hand anomalies can affect the self-esteem of the child. Evaluation of Poland syndrome can begin in the prenatal period itself. Prenatal sonographic evaluation can demonstrate unilateral limb defects and unilateral chest wall asymmetry and if this is noted it needs prompt evaluation for other associated anatomic defects. In the adult patient, although physical examination is usually sufficient in the diagnosis of Poland syndrome, further evaluation with CT scan can be performed, especially in the setting of surgical planning or further evaluation for associated cardiopulmonary abnormalities including lung herniation. On mammograms, Hypoplasia of the unilateral breast and hypoplasia of the pectoralis major are often appreciated. Ultrasound of the chest wall can also be used to evaluate for defects of the pectoralis major and minor musculature. The treatment of Poland syndrome consists firstly of reconstruction of the breast, deficient muscle contour and chest wall deformity and that is beyond the scope of this video. We also need to do a reconstruction of the syndactyly hand. The principles of syndactyly release should be followed in this surgery also. But as far as the outcomes of surgical management of syndactyly of Poland syndrome are concerned, the separated individual fingers may be less functional than before the surgery indicating a poor outcome. So we need to evaluate the child and talk to the parents about the problems that can occur because the movements of individual fingers may not be complete as the parents may expect. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please do click on the shown links to see more about other congenital problems like congenital syndactyly and the surgical management. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, plastic surgery, 
ट्रॉमा सर्जरी एंड एथिक्स